Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're gonna to take a look at the Aya Neo AM01. And there's a couple unique things about it. Number one is the fact that it's made by Aya Neo, a company that usually makes handhelds. So it's kind of neat that they're moving into a new form factor. And it's also a great fit for this channel because I do a lot of mini PC reviews. I think I've done over 35 at this point. Now, another unique aspect is the design. It has very retro feel to it. And it's also modeled after the original Macintosh, which believe it or not, came out almost 40 years ago at this point. Now, when the Macintosh first came came out, it was known for being a very small computer. So it's kind of fitting that it's small like this with this mini PC as well. So it's kind of a neat homage to that whole idea. And finally, the third thing that's a little surprising about this is that it's competitively priced, especially when you look at others in the market with the same CPU. Typically, when it comes to INEO devices, they charge more than others. So it's kind of neat to see that. Anyway, what we'll do in this video here is we'll go through all the testing I usually do with all of my mini PCs, and we'll see how it stacks up when it comes to price to performance. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, let's get started with the specs. Now, number one, we have two different CPU options, but the one I'll be testing in this review is the higher spec one, which is a Ryzen 7 5700U. And this is a laptop CPU that's been out for about three years at this point. And it has eight cores and 16 threads with a base clock of 1.6 gigahertz. And the chip has integrated Vega 8 graphics, which are a couple generations behind at this point. This mini PC also comes with LPDDR4 RAM, which can be configured up to 64 gigabytes. And same thing with the storage in that it is configurable. It uses an M.2 2280 stick. In addition to the M.2 drive, you can also add your own two and a half inch hard drive or SSD. When it comes to connectivity, we have Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, and gigabit ethernet. We've also got a bunch of other ports, including one USB-C, four USB-A, and a 3.5 millimeter headphone microphone jack. And the operating system is Windows 11 Home. And the other thing worth noting is there is a bare bones option. So if you have your own RAM and hard drive, you can add that yourself and save a little bit of money. Now the AM01 is currently up for pre-order on the Indiegogo page, but after that, it'll probably shift over to the iAneo website. And when it comes to choosing your options, you've got a lot of different configuration choices. To start, we have two different CPU options and the low end one is a Ryzen 3 3200U. Now the performance jump between these two is pretty significant, but the price difference is not. And so even though it is tempting to get one of these for 200 bucks, I think you're better off spending a little bit more money to get the 5700U. And the lowest price that we have available right right now is $240 for the bare bone version. But of course, bear in mind, that's not going to come with a hard drive or RAM. So you'll have to add that yourself. And the configuration options that include RAM and storage are actually pretty decent. So unless you can find a really good deal when it comes to RAM and storage, it might be in your best interest to just let iNeo install it for you. Anyway, here's a full readout of the price and specs. And some of these early bird prices are still available, but it will go up after that. And for me personally, I'm thinking of this as a $300 mini PC. If you look at that price point, that'll give you 16 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigs of storage, which I think is pretty standard for most PCs that come out at this price point. And like I mentioned, I think the price point is pretty competitive. If you look at a similar model from B-Link, this one has the same chip, 16 gigs of RAM, as well as 500 gigs of storage. And as you can see, the price is actually about $20 higher than the iNeo one, even when you apply the $50 coupon they have available right now. And so I do find this pretty surprising because iNeo often is more expensive than the competition. So the fact that this is cheaper, even if it's still during early bird pricing, that's pretty impressive. But also keep in mind that the prices will fluctuate a lot for these low-end mini PCs. So you may see a sale that's going to be better than this sometime in the future. So let's go ahead and move into the unboxing. As a quick disclaimer, this is a review unit sent over to me from iNeo, but no money was exchanged in any way. Of note, the model I'm reviewing is the highest spec one, so it has 32 gigs of RAM and one terabyte of storage. But when it comes down to it, I don't think that 32 gigabytes of RAM was actually necessary, nor did it actually affect performance. With an older and lower powered chipset like this, I don't think that additional RAM is actually even being used. Anyway, inside you'll get a pretty thorough instruction manual. This will actually walk you through almost all components that you would have questions about with this mini PC. In fact, this is a lot more comprehensive than manuals I've seen from other manufacturers. They also have an instruction manual for their IS space software, which we'll go over in this video. Finally, they've also got some stickers for your kids if you want them. Let's go ahead and keep digging and see what other goodies we have inside. First of all, we have our power supply. This is branded by iNeo and it's rated for 72 watts of power. Now this is a universal plug and it comes with a bunch of different adapters. So no matter what region of Antarctica you're living in, you will probably find the plug that meets your needs. For me, I'm gonna use the boring North American plug, but it does lock into place very easily. 
We've also got three different color options when it comes to the little chiclet tab at the top of the device. And these are all magnetic, so it's very easy to swap them out, but personally, I like the original rainbow color because it reminds me of the Macintosh. Moving on, they also include an HDMI cable as well as a SATA cable if you want to hook up that two and a half inch drive. And by the way, it also comes with a two and a half inch bracket for your hard drive. Other than that, we've got some cheap tools to be able to disassemble the device, and then of course a bunch of screws to go with it. Now let's take a look at the mini PC itself, and it's a little bit disorienting when you first look at it because the top of it is supposed to be the front of the Macintosh. And so it did take me a minute to wrap my head around this concept, especially because the marketing materials show this device on its side. So that's definitely just one thing to bear in mind when you're actually using it. Of note, the brown button on the right side is the power button. Now if we flip it over, this is the actual front, and it's pretty bare bones. This is a USB 3.2 Gen 1 port, so it's not USB 4 and it's not video capable. And then we have our 3.5mm headphone jack. I always like it when these are on the front because it makes them easy to access. Now we don't have a lot going on on the sides other than a bunch of ventilation. And speaking of which, the whole bottom of this mini PC is also well ventilated. It also has two holes on the bottom for a visa mount, so if you wanted to attach this to a back of a monitor, you could definitely do that. Next, let's take a look at the I.O. on the back. To start, we have our power plug, then we have our two video out, HDMI 2.0 as well as DisplayPort 1.4. And then we have four USB-A ports. Three of them are USB 3.2 and one is USB 2.0. And then finally, we have our single gigabit ethernet port. And that's really it when it comes to the mini PC hardware specs. It's pretty clean overall in terms of design. And I think it's a small and compact form factor. To give you a comparative example, here's an Xbox controller, which is actually a little bit wider than the mini PC, but not quite as tall. Next, I wanna move into the teardown. This is actually gonna be a longer section because there's quite a bit to talk about here. Now to unattach the bottom, you have to remove the four Phillips head screws embedded in the feet, and then use a guitar pick to undo the clips around the back. And the first thing you're gonna notice is that the motherboard is not immediately accessible. In fact, the CPU fan is in the way and you have to remove this in order to get the rest out. Now this is pretty easy. There's actually three screws altogether, but one of the weird things is that the third screw was covered with a warranty sticker. And this is kind of weird because if you want to upgrade the RAM or the storage, that means you have to effectively void your warranty. Either way, to remove the fan, you have to pull the sticker off of the heatsink, and it might feel like you're breaking the device, but don't worry, it'll go right back on. And I'm going through this pretty quickly, but all of this is detailed in the instruction manual. Either way, once you've removed the fan, now it's time to take out the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip. And this has an M.2 chip, which is very easy to remove. Also of note, there's a small ribbon cable you have to detach that's right next to the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip. Now the RAM and SSD are actually underneath the motherboard, so we have to take the whole motherboard assembly out, and this is where I actually ran into an issue with my review unit. According to the instructions, there's only supposed to be three screws holding it in, but after removing those three screws, I realized that the motherboard was still very much so fastened in place. So I ended up having to disassemble the whole shebang, including the heatsink. And sure enough, after removing all of this, I did realize there was a fourth screw attached to the motherboard. Now, I reached out to INEO about this, and they said they're only going to include those three motherboard screws, but the review units had four. So chances are you're not going to have to go this far in the teardown in order to access the back, but I did want to show you how to do that in case you do have the same issue. Either way, once the motherboard has been unscrewed, it's pretty easy to take out. And here's a look at the top, including the CPU, which is typically going to be covered by that heatsink. But of course, all the stuff we want to actually get to is on the back. To start, let's look at the RAM. So this is DDR4 and it has a 3200 megahertz transfer speed. Of note, this is dual channel and I have two 16 gigabyte sticks. On the opposite side is our 2280 M.2 slot. This is going to be your SSD. But like I mentioned before, you also have the ability to expand it. Here's the SATA port on the right. So the way this works is if you have a two and a half inch drive like this one terabyte SSD, you can install this directly into the AM01 using the two and a half inch bracket that comes with the mini PC. And so all you would have to do is just line up the screw holes, screw it into place, and then you would install the bracket here at the top of the AM01. And then of course to connect everything you use this SATA cable that comes with it. This longer part will go directly into the SSD and then you've got your SATA connection as well as power ports on the other side. And these are located right next to each other on the motherboard so it's a pretty intuitive process. And so that's what I would recommend doing if you want to expand the storage on the AM01. You can have two different SSDs running at the same time. But I would bear in mind that the teardown process here is not as simple as it is in most other mini PCs available on the market. Now I don't think you'll have to go as far as I did in terms of pulling off the heatsink as well as applying your own thermal paste. That being said, if you're not used to taking apart computers, it could be pretty intimidating. So if you you have an IT tech friend, they might be able to help you out. Or at the very least, the instruction manual is pretty darn thorough if you want to tackle it yourself. Long story short, I do appreciate the fact that we have the ability to expand the storage and RAM, 
But I do think that the process is way more involved than it should be, and so overall I do consider this to be a negative point for the AM01. And I do hope that if Ioneo continues to make more mini PCs, they think about the upgradeability aspect. After all, most of the people buying mini PCs probably don't want to go and tear the entire thing apart. Anyway, now that we've put it all back together, let's boot it up and go into the software. And to start, like I mentioned, this is Windows 11 Home, so booting it up is just going to be like any other new PC, but there are a couple unique aspects, including a custom wallpaper, which looks pretty fancy. In addition, Ioneo has their own custom software, which is called Aya Space. And if you've ever watched a video about an Ioneo handheld, it's almost the exact same thing. So when you first get started, it's going to ask you to update and reinstall, and then once you're in there, you will see that it kind of works like a custom front end. So as you install games, you'll be able to see them right here on the front page, and you can navigate to them. Also within here on the top left is a settings menu, and there's a couple things worth noting within here. Number one is going to be the performance tab. Within here, you can set the TDP limit. And when it comes to your typical INEO handhelds, this can be really important. After all, you want to find that balance between power and battery life. However, because we're using a stationary mini PC, battery life doesn't matter at all. And so in that regard, I would recommend just putting it to the full 35 watt TDP. And so that's going to give us the best performance. And that's what I used in all my testing throughout the rest of this video. Another setting worth considering is the monitor section. This is going to give you a performance overlay. So if you want to see the overall frames per second or the temperature and load of the CPU and GPU, this is where you would find it. Other than that, I would say that most of the other settings within IS Space are things that you configure within Windows itself, or there are sections that just don't apply to this mini PC at all. For example, there's a controller section, but again, this is not a handheld, it's a mini PC. So in the end, I would say the main benefit of IS Space is to be able to max out the TDP and then to add the performance overlay if you want it. Other than that, you can mostly ignore their inbuilt software. So let's go ahead and start our testing. First thing I want to do is update my GPU drivers. So I'm going to go into the AMD Adrenaline app, which is already pre-installed, and then just update the firmware within here. And after that, we're ready to go. So I'm going to jump into Cinebench first. And there's a couple things worth noting. At idle, we're getting about 46 degrees in temperature, and the power draw seems to be somewhere between 2.5 and, and 5 watts. Now when we turn on a 10-minute multi-core test, you can see it jump up significantly. And at 100% CPU load, you can see that the power profile is around 35 watts. And that makes sense because that's what we configured for the TDP limit. Now that we're running at a full load, let's do a sound test. I'm also going to test it by pressing on Xbox buttons so you get a feel of the ambient sound in the room. So overall, I would say this is not a quiet mini PC. When it's running at max load, you can definitely tell that it's there on your desk. But all the same, I would still say it's quieter than a full-size PC or pressing down on an Xbox controller button. Anyway, after about 10 minutes of testing, you can see the Cinebench is still running at a 100% load, and I found that the CPU temperature hovers around 80 degrees Celsius. It's a little bit on the high side, but I think anything under 90 is still pretty good. And of note, it kept a pretty steady 35 watt power profile the entire time. Now in terms of Cinebench score, we got about 9,000. To give you context, the high-end APUs on the market right now go around 16,000. So overall, we're getting better than half the performance of APUs that cost about twice as much in price. Next, we'll move over to a GPU-intensive benchmark with the 3 d Mark Time Spy. And the score here you can see is a little bit under 1500. And again, with the top-end APUs on the market like the 7840U, you can usually expect about 3000 with the score. And so again, it's pretty similar in that we're getting about half the performance for something that costs about half as much. Now for me personally, I don't put a lot of weight in synthetic benchmarks. Instead, I like to focus on real-world results. So let's do a couple other tests. We're going to start with video playback. So here I am running YouTube at 4K 60Hz, and the big thing I want to do here is start up the video and see how many frames are going to drop as I do the playback. And right off the bat, when I pressed play, I dropped one frame, but after that, no other frames dropped. In fact, I kept playing it for several minutes, and even after about 7,000 frames, it was still running with only that one dropped frame at the beginning. So I think when it comes to 4K video playback, or even using it for encoding with a media server, this is going to work out pretty well. Another test I like to run is a video editing test. So here I'm grabbing one of my older videos, and I'm going to chop it up a bunch, and then I'm going to move all the video parts around, and then I'm also going to shrink it down to just one minute of footage. On top of that, I'm going to add some titles and transitions to make it a little bit harder to render, and then I'm going to render it into a 1080p 60 frames per second video. And my goal here is that for a one minute clip, I want the rendering time to be less than one minute. And and sure enough, this actually ran really well. In fact, the rendering time was only 38 seconds for this one minute clip. 
So if you want to do some light video editing or even audio engineering on this mini PC, I think it's going to be more than capable. And of course, all the other computer related tasks you can think of, you know, shopping on the web, doing other web browsing, spreadsheets and taxes, you can do all that here as well. And finally, before we jump into the exciting stuff like video games, let's talk about the BIOS. Now the BIOS may be different from mine because I have a review unit versus a retail one, but at least for mine, the BIOS were entirely unlocked. So if you want to go in here and adjust any of the settings, you can definitely do that. Now this is very much so an advanced topic, so I would not recommend just going in here and changing values, but I expect that as time marches on, there will probably be a lot of people making tweaks probably within the INEO Discord, so if you want to learn more about that, I would check it out there. Either way, it is nice to see that I have full access to all the configurations that I want. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's now jump into the video game testing. We're going to start with PC games and then work our way up to emulation. We'll start with the lightweight games, you know, things like Celeste and Dead Cells, and all of these work perfectly fine. And I'm going to use a 1080p resolution as my baseline standard. And for all these games with your typical default or medium settings, yeah, they're all running at 60 frames per second, no problem. In fact, if you turn off VSync with these lightweight games, you'll get some really high frame rates. For example, here with Hollow Knight, the average frames per second is about 180, so that's really good. Now, moving up to games that are a little bit more demanding, like Hades or Cult of the Lamb, these also still run at a pretty steady 60 frames per second, even at the default or medium settings. So overall, I think when it comes to lightweight PC gaming, any of those indie type titles, you're going to have no problem here. Let's move on to other types of games. Number one, we'll start with a real time strategy game with Age of Empires 2. And this one runs at 1080p ultra settings at about 100 frames per second. So this is running really well. In addition, if you want more story based games like Disco Elysium, this one runs just fine at 1080p medium settings too. Now, when we move over to competitive shooters, it's not quite as good. So for example, here with Counter Strike 2, I'm getting an average frame rate about 70 frames per second. Now, personally, I wouldn't consider that to be like terrible, but all the same, if you're playing competitively, you probably want something that's at least 90 frames per second or better. So I would say probably don't buy this specifically if you're going to be playing these types of games. Next, we're going to move up to what I would consider like Xbox 360 era games, games like Bioshock Infinite or Street Fighter V. And at 1080p with medium settings, these games run fine as well. It's a pretty steady 60 frames per second. I would get a dip every once in a while, but all the same, it's still a pretty smooth experience. Moving on from there, let's try Grand Theft Auto V. This is at 1080p with a mixture of medium and low settings. And unfortunately, this one really can't keep up to 60 frames per second. Instead, the average is about 55. Now, I still think this is a pretty enjoyable experience and I wouldn't mind playing it with these stats, but of course, that's really going to depend on you and your particular playstyle. Now, as we start moving up to the more demanding PC games, you'll probably have to make quite a few sacrifices. We'll start with Doom Eternal. So I'm playing this at a 900p resolution and with medium settings. And when I drop that resolution factor, it does get quite fuzzy. So this is not a perfect experience. And it also struggles to maintain 60 frames per second. So this is not going to be super great. After you start trying to play games that are even harder to run, you're probably going to have to make more sacrifices. And we'll start with Control. This is a game that's really hard to run without a dedicated graphics card. And you can see here that it's 720p low settings. I'm getting an average of about 38 frames per second. So here I would probably lock it at 30 frames per second and treat it more like a console experience. But even then with a 720p resolution and low settings, it does look pretty fuzzy. Moving on from there, let's try out Elden Ring. Same thing, 720p low settings. And this one's definitely playable. I would say the frame rate's around 40 frames per second, so it feels pretty smooth, but it definitely doesn't look good. This has got a really grainy texture to it. Now, one thing to note, this chip is capable of running FSR. And so as a result, some games like God of War, you can run at 1080p low settings and then turn FSR on. Just bear in mind, you've got to really crank it to make this game playable. And so even though you can keep it above 30 frames per second, it just looks pretty gnarly. In fact, it almost feels like playing a PS2 game at this point. And I had a similar experience with Horizon Zero Dawn. Again, we're playing at 720p low settings with FSR set to the quality mode. But even then, yes, this looks pretty bad. You got to consider that this used to be a PS4 game and now it looks like a PS2 game. And so I'm not really sure that you would enjoy this. For me personally, I don't think I could play this game with this type of graphics. Okay, we got two more games to benchmark. We're going to start with Witcher 3. This is running at 900p resolution with low settings. And this one here actually struggles to maintain 30 frames per second. So this again is not going to be a great experience. And we're kind of in a similar situation. If you drop it down to 720p, it's not going to look very good. And so overall for me, this is just too many compromises to really enjoy this game. It's going to be a similar experience with Baldur's Gate 3. This one you have to run at 720p in low settings and even then your average frame rate is going to be about 25-26 frames per second. So unfortunately when it comes to some of these heavy hitting or AAA games it's just not really up to the task. But of course bear in mind this is not really meant to play AAA games. This is a low tier mini PC. 
So that's really it when it comes to the PC gaming experience, let's move on to emulation. We're going to really just focus on the high-end system, starting with Nintendo 3DS. And the performance here is pretty darn good. I'm using the Canary version of Citra at a 3x resolution. And basically every single game I threw at it played at full speed. I'd get a couple stutters here and there when the shaders were first compiling, but after a few minutes of playing each game, it ran super smooth. So if you are looking for something to play 3DS games, this will be a great fit. Moving on from there, let's try out Nintendo GameCube using the Dolphin emulator with a 3x resolution upscale. That's going to be about 1440p. And sure enough, every game I threw at it played really well. Some games were absolutely perfect, including Mario Sunshine and Mario Golf. And even F-Zero GX actually played completely smooth, no dips at all. The only game I really had any sort of trouble with was Rogue Squadron 2. It would sometimes drop down to like 58 frames per second here and there, and you would feel that stutter every once in a while. But I found that the longer I played it, the smoother it got. And considering this is one of the hardest games to emulate on GameCube, that's a pretty great sign. And it's also a similar experience with PS2, again at a 3x resolution, so around 1440p. And again, every game I threw at it played at a pretty stable 60 frames per second. And so this is great, I didn't really have to mess around with the settings at all, I just set it to 3x resolution and then booted up the games and all of them were running at full speed. And that includes God of War 2, even at a 3x resolution it was nice and stable. Sticking with the same generation, let's move over to the original Xbox. We're going to use the Zemu emulator at a native resolution. And there were a couple games that played pretty well. We're going to start with Soul Calibur 2. One thing to note, don't pay attention to the frames per second up top. Instead, look at that little video debug box below it. And on the left side, you can see the FPS. That's going to be a more accurate representation. And you can see that with this game, we're getting an average of about 57 frames per second. So it's not perfect, but pretty close. Another game that worked pretty well is Halo Combat Evolved. This one had an original frame rate of 30 frames per second, and it's pretty stable right here. However, most of the other games that I tried were not playable, even at just the native resolution. So for example, with Dead or Alive 3, as well as Project Gotham Racing, both of these games played at half speed, and so definitely not a playable experience. However, we will come back to Xbox when we get into our Linux game testing later in the video. Either way, let's go ahead and move on to our next system, which is going to be Nintendo Wii U. In this one, I'm going to run all the games at a 1080p resolution, and yeah, thankfully all these are running great. Now, this is not a huge surprise for me just because the Wii U emulator is so good, and so I would say the majority of Wii U games are going to play perfectly on this machine. The ultimate test is going to be Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and this one I'm running at a 720p resolution, but I'm still getting about 40 frames per second as my average frame rate. By the way, watch this part right here. I have no idea how I did this. I just literally shot this thing with an arrow and it just went flying. That is awesome. Either way, yes, when it comes to this price point, this is probably the best performance I've seen with Breath of the Wild. And so overall, I would say Nintendo Wii U is completely playable on the iNeo AM01. Now let's move on to the more heavy hitting system, starting with PlayStation 3. Now when it comes to lightweight or 2D games, things like Afterburner Climax, Outrun Online Arcade, as well as Dead or Alive 5, yeah, absolutely no problem here. All these games are running at a full frame rate. So if you want to stick to the more lightweight PS3 games, yeah, no problem whatsoever. However, once you start moving into the more 3D based games, you will run into problems. On the lighter end of the spectrum when it comes to 3D games is going to be Devil May Cry, and unfortunately this one cannot reach 30 frames per second all the time. So already we're seeing that some of these games are not going to play at full speed. Now moving on to Ratchet & Clank Quest for Booty, this one cannot get a full 60 frames per second, but it stays above 30, and so it's going to be a pretty smooth experience with a couple dips here and there. However, as you start moving into the harder to play games like Prince of Persia, unfortunately this cannot hit 30 frames per second at all. So unfortunately I would say that the PS3 performance on this system is not great unless you only want to play 2D or lightweight games. It's going to be a similar story with Xbox 360. There are some games that run pretty well, like Forza Horizon, but a lot of the other games, especially those that are more 3D based, are going to struggle. So for example, Crackdown does not play at full speed, and even though Gears of War does say it's playing at 30 frames per second most of the time, I found it to be a really stuttery experience. And so unless we see a lot of improvements when it comes to efficiency of this emulator in the future, I just wouldn't expect to play a lot of Xbox 360 or PS3 games on this computer. And then finally, our last emulated system within Windows is going to be Nintendo Switch. And unfortunately, this one does struggle quite a bit. Now, when it comes to 2D based games, things like Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, this one does run at full speed, but you have to set it to handheld mode. That means it's going to decrease the resolution factor, and so it's not going to look very good. Either way, if you are going to play some lighter weight games, yes, they'll probably play okay. However, as you start moving your way up, you are going to run into problems. For example, with Super Mario Bros. Wonder, I'm playing this in handheld mode with a smooth frames per second mod, and it's still not reaching 60 frames per second. 
And it's a similar story with Super Mario Odyssey, but it's even worse because the graphics just look kind of really fuzzy and terrible in handheld mode. And of course, it's not getting anywhere close to full speed either. And for other Switch games, I had problems just playing them in the first place. For example, with Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, this one had all sorts of graphical issues. And for other games like Super Mario 3D World, it would not boot into the actual game screen. And then also Metroid Prime Remastered just froze on me as soon as I started trying to play. So long story short, when it comes to Nintendo Switch emulation, I would say this is probably going to be a big no unless you're playing really lightweight games. Okay, next we're going to boot into Linux using a custom firmware called Botticera. And I made a bunch of guides about this, but essentially all you have to do is load this operating system onto a flash drive. And then when you boot into the flash drive, it's going to include all of your emulators and games right there on the system. And so this is a great way to transform a mini PC like this one into a retro gaming console. And this is one of my favorite weekend projects to do with a lot of these mini PCs. I'll leave my full guide linked down below, which includes a video and written guide. Either way, in addition to the retro games, you can also push the limit with some other systems. So let's try out a couple of those. We'll start with Nintendo Wii U. I just want to make sure that the performance here is just as good as it was on Windows. And yeah, sure enough, everything here is playing at full speed. Another system I like to test is PlayStation 2. This one doesn't have access to DirectX 11 and Linux, and so because of that, you have to rely on OpenGL or Vulkan as the graphics backend. However, here I'm playing God of War 2 at a 3x resolution, both in OpenGL and Vulkan, and while they're not hitting a full steady 60 frames per second, they are very close. In fact, I would consider the game to be playable with either of these graphics backends as long as you're okay with the stutter here and there. So that does mean that most PS2 games are going to play at a full 3x resolution, no problem here in Botticera. And finally, the last system I wanted to test is the original Xbox here in Linux, because this will often play better than in Windows. And yeah, sure enough, I can play most of these games at a full speed, but at a 2x resolution. So not only are these games playing better than they were on Windows, but I'm actually up upscaling it to twice the graphics rendering and it's still working better. So in the end I would still consider Xbox to be playable but I would recommend playing it through Linux instead of Windows. Alright so that's it for testing let's go ahead and start wrapping up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the i and Neo AM01. And we'll start with what I like and number one it has a great design to it. I love the fact that it looks like an old Macintosh but I also really like that it has a classic and retro look to it. I think that they did a really good job coming up with a unique design for this mini PC. I'm also surprised to find that the price is relatively fair, especially compared to other mini PCs with this exact same CPU loadout. I also like the fact that this mini PC is really configurable. Not only do we have access to the unlocked BIOS, but I can also boot into other operating systems including Linux, and so that's great. I also think the performance here is pretty decent, especially when it comes to emulation. You can essentially play all the way up to Wii U with no problem whatsoever. And as long as you stick to lightweight games, you can play some of the other heavy hitting systems pretty well too. And it's a similar story with PC gaming. If you want to play lightweight or indie titles, absolutely no problem. But you can also kind of push it all the way up to about the Xbox 360 era as well. I also think the AM01 is going to work really well as a workstation. So if you want to use it for audio engineering, video editing, or as a media server, it's all going to work great and it's going to work perfectly for daily tasks like using a web browser or even just checking your email or a spreadsheet. And finally, I know I already talked about design, but I just want to reiterate, this looks very good on a desk. I've tested a lot of mini PCs on this channel, but this is probably one of my favorites from an aesthetic standpoint. However, like with any other mini PC, this one is not perfect. So let's talk about the things I don't like about it. Number one, I think the fan noise is a little bit on the loud side. It is quite a bit louder than other mini PCs in the same price range. So if you are looking for something that's exceptionally quiet, this is not going to be it. I also found that the upgrade process was a lot harder than it needed to be. Now I did have my own personal hiccup in the fact that I had one too many screws on my motherboard, but all the same, even with the retail units, I think that an average user is still going to kind of struggle just to replace the RAM and SSD. And I think that's really a shame considering the fact that this is a very good entry level mini PC. And then finally, the last note I have here is that I would consider this to be a double A gaming PC. So if you're looking to play the latest and greatest AAA titles, this is not the mini PC for you. Unfortunately, at this price, point it's pretty hard to find something that'll be able to play every game. So in the end of the day you're probably wondering what I think about this mini PC and I think the best thing I can do is compare it against others that I've reviewed before. So here is my mini PC comparison spreadsheet which I'll leave linked down below. And as I review every new unit I put it in the spreadsheet. And here you can see the iNeo 2 is kind of in the top part, which means it's one of the cheaper mini PCs. But if you look at it horizontally against others within the same price range, you can see that it outperforms many of them. And so what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to make this my recommended pick anywhere between the $300 and $350 price point. Because I think among all the other competition right here, I would rather use the iNeo AM01. 
And so I guess that really kind of summarizes things. If you are looking for something around that price point, this so far has been the best one that I've tested. It's definitely not going to be a powerhouse, so if you're looking to play PS3 and Xbox 360 or AAA PC titles, this is not going to be it. But if you're looking for a fairly lightweight and cheap mini PC that's going to look really good on your desk or in your media center, I think this is going to be a great buy. And as long as you're good with the limitations of this chipset, I think you'll be pretty happy with this price point. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Are you considering a mini PC like this, and is this one the right fit for you, or would you rather have something with a little bit more power to it? At the end of the day, I'm just really surprised that I and Neo made such a good mini PC on their very first effort. And so it does make me excited if they continue to make more mini PCs in the future. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.